Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Today's scripture comes from John 10, uh, verses 22 through 42. At that time, the feast of the dedication took place at Jerusalem. It was winter, and Jesus was walking in the temple in the portico of Solomon. The Jews then gathered around him and said to him, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, these testify of me. But you do not believe because you are not of my sheep. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. And I give eternal life to them and they will never perish. And no one will snatch them out of my hand. My father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of the father's hand. I and the father are one. The Jews picked up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered them, I showed you the many good works from the Father. For which of them are you stoning me? The Jews answered him, For a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy, and because you, being a man, make yourself out to be God. Jesus answered them, Has it not been written in your law, I said you are gods? If he called them gods, to whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken. Do you say of him, whom the Father sacrificed and sent into the world, you are blaspheming, because I said, I am the Son of God? If I do not the works of my Father, do not believe me. But if I do them, though you do not believe me, believe the works, so that you may know and understand that the Father is in me, and I in the Father. Therefore they were seeking again to seize him, and he eluded their grasp. And he went away again beyond the Jordan to the place where John was first baptizing, and he was staying there. Many came to him and were saying, while John performed no sign, yet everything John said about this man was true. Many believed in him there. Amen. us and guide us in Jesus name. Amen. Well, yep. Sorry. I didn't change the little thing. We are, I'm going to back it up a little bit into verse 19, um, for our study this morning. Cause that's kind of where we left off. Um, we've been going through this totally awesome section of scripture. Uh, Jesus has been kind of giving an exposition of himself. Who is the Christ? Let me tell you who the Christ is, basically, is what he's going through. If you want to know who Jesus really is, <laughs> listen to his words. He'll tell you. And he's not shy about getting it across exactly who he is. That's what's disrupting this whole area with the Jews and everything. But up to this point in this section, Jesus has explained that he is the... Uh, Fulfillment of God's promise to save God's sheep. He's the fulfillment of that. He, he has explained that he is God in flesh, the good shepherd, right? The good one, the, the shepherd, the good one. Um, he has explained that we are his sheep and that we are owned by him. He's explained that all salvation is only through him, the exclusive door. And we read that only in Jesus is true provision granted. 
Jesus explained that he is making a bigger fold, that is to include us, that we are counted as his sheep. And then Jesus explained how all of that was possible. That's what we did last week with communion. All of that is possible by himself, the good shepherd, humbling himself, becoming a sheep like us, basically, becoming the lamb and substituting his life for ours. Point after point, Jesus is proving himself to be the good shepherd. Point after point, Jesus is going through, as he explains who he is, his purpose here, his the Father's purpose here on earth. It's for the salvation of the sheep. It's to heal those that are sick or bind up those that are wounded. It is to give sight to the blind. It is to find the lost sheep. That's what his purpose is. Ezekiel 34, um, 15 and 16 says, I will feed my flock and I will lead them to rest, declares the Lord God. I will seek the lost, bring back the scattered, bind up the broken, and strengthen the sick. This is totally what Jesus is doing. And in our discussion uh, last week, um, we even compared Ezekiel a little bit, talking about it when Jesus went into the synagogue and read from Isaiah, right? He says in the synagogue, and I'll paraphrase that, I'm here to uh, preach the gospel, set people free, give people sight. And today, Isaiah is being fulfilled in your midst. And then he held the mic up and dropped the mic. <laughs> if they would have had mics, that would have been a mic drop moment. But that's kind of what he said. And that kind of parallels exactly what we're seeing here in Ezekiel. Jesus is the good shepherd that goes before his sheep as he leads them. Jesus is the good shepherd that, that actually stays behind his sheep to protect them from, from behind. He picks his sheep up out of the trench, <laughs> finds them when they stray. He walks alongside them to encourage them. And when his sheep cannot walk... He picks them up and carries them. That is the good shepherd. That is who we're talking about. So now in verse 19, I said we're going to back it up a little bit. In verse 19, we see more of the bad shepherds, the ones that Jesus is saying, <laughs> you guys. We see more of the bad shepherd's response. In verse 19, it says, And a division occurred among the Jews because of these words. Many of them were saying, He has a demon, and he is insane. Why do you listen to him? Others were saying, These are not the sayings of a demon possessed, of one demon possessed. A demon cannot open the eyes of the blind, can he? Remember, we're still in the midst of the same situation where Jesus just healed this blind guy and came back and now there's this whole chaos going on because Jesus healed a blind guy. And the blind guy, you know, I love, remember his sarcasm. Do you want to be his disciple too? You know, so that's the scene that we're still in and they're, they're upset to say the least. The Jewish leaders are very upset to say the least. They, they fall back on their Jewish leadership skills. And, and the fallback skill for any, I would say, liberal, just like what they are, is when they're losing an argument, their far, fallback skill is, you're just dumb. <laughs> you're, you're just a bigot, right? They resort to name-calling. They're losing the argument. They have nothing to to offer that will help them gain anything. So they fall back to name calling and here's the Jewish leaders going, you have a demon. You're just insane. 
because they can't say anything that counters anything that Jesus has done, modeled, said, or that's really been said about him in truth. So the I can't win attitude comes up and I can't win so I name call and I throw myself on the floor and throw a tantrum is basically what they're doing. So that's where we are. Verses 22 and 23 give us a date stamp. And I like this. Um, 22 says, At the time, at that time, the Feast of Dedication took place at Jerusalem. It was winter, and Jesus was walking in the temple in the portico of Solomon, or Solomon's porch. Here is our date stamp, right? At that time, the Feast of Dedication took place. So, we start looking at that, and we understand that that's Hanukkah, right? That's where we get Hanukkah, right? Dreidel, 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 I made you out of clay. Does everybody know that song, right? No? Yes. yes, right? And when you're dried and ready, oh, dreidel, we will play, right? Okay. Where is that in the Bible? That's where we just got to go. Where is that in the Bible and what is a dreidel? Those are a couple questions that we must answer knowing that this is Hanukkah. A dreidel is a little Jewish toy that's a little square top and they spin it, right? And on each side of the square... It says, a great miracle has happened here. And basically, you put some money in a pot, and you spin it, and whatever it lands on, you either get no money, you get all of the money, you get half the money. So basically, it's a way to teach little Hebrew boys how to gamble. Okay? That's, that's, that's what it is. But a dreidel, or Hanukkah, or the Feast of Dedication, where we're at right now, all came out of the period of time that was in between the Old Testament prophets, the last prophet spoke, and then all of a sudden you have John the Baptist coming on, on board, and then Jesus. So in between that time, it's that intertest, intertestamental, testa, Intertestament all. Say that a whole bunch of times fast. Um, it's that section or that 400 years of silence. They call it 400 years of silence. God was speaking through his prophets. He stopped speaking through his prophets. And then now we have the prophet John the Baptist. So, um, Alexander the Great was in charge, right? And then Alexander the Great defeated, or Alexander the Great, Darius was in charge, and Alexander the Great defeated Darius, and then um, in comes Greek philosophy and all of the uh, <laughs> Greek ideas. Alexander is pushing Greek everything, and this is that 400 years. This is that in-between time. Um, he even had the Old Testament because he was pushing Greek so much. He had the Old Testament translated into Greek, modern day Greek, Koine Greek, which is the uh, Septuagint. Okay, so he was really pushing Greek. But um, Alexander was kind of a freedom of religion kind of guy. He's like, okay, I like my religion, you like your religion. So he allowed some religious freedoms. And then all of a sudden, Alexander dies. And this um, Syrian guy, Antiochus Epiphanes, takes over. And, and when you start looking at Antiochus Epiphanes, he's one of the most, I would say, unknown villains in the Bible. He's, and, and yet he's one of the worst villains when it comes to being against um, Israel and God. He was not... So freedom of religion. Antiochus was absolutely not. He, he called himself Antiochus Epiphanes, right? Because Epiphanes means, I'm going to give myself a title, illustrious one, right? It, it means God manifested one. But he was so bad, 
He was such a bad leader that the people that followed or the people that were underneath him, they made it a game and they, instead of calling him Epiphanes, they called him Epiph or Epimenes, Antiochus Epimenes. They just changed a little tiny bit of a letter and it changed it from the illustrious one to the insane one. Just change a little bit of letter and instead of being God manifested, now you are a madman. Okay? So, about 170 BC, he came in and defiles the temple, stealing all of the treasure, erecting an altar to Zeus inside the temple. He sacrificed a pig on the Jewish altar, right? And then, if that wasn't enough, he made soup, basically, or broth out of that pig. And he took that broth and he sprinkled it over everything you can imagine inside the temple. He totally defiles the temple. And when the Jews showed their outrage, right, he murdered countless of them. They're like, you defiled our temple. Okay, you're dead. You can't do that. You're dead. And countless Jews got murdered because of them. He was a horrible, crazy leader. He was so bad that he made a law that if a mother, because this is the Jewish thing, he was so anti-Semitic, that if, if a Jewish mother had their son circumcised, he would crucify the mom, strangle the baby, and hang it around the mom as she was hanging on the cross. This is what's happening to Israel in that 400 years, in, those, in that silence. Well, three years after the defilement of the temple, <clears throat> when the Jews finally get back in there to purify it, they're going through the temple, they're finding what's left in there, and they find one tiny little vial of oil. This one little tiny vial of oil was all that they had that was not defiled. Well, they lit the menorah with that little oil, and then they say a, mir a, a miracle happened. That one little tiny vial that should have lasted a half a day lasted for an entire eight days, allowing them to create more oil to light the menorah and keep the menorah going. So, that is the reason Hanukkah, okay, is eight days. It's because the Feast of Dedication, when they were when they were cleaning up the temple, rededicating it to the Lord, that's how long it lasted. So this is the, the feast that they're at. They're at a feast celebrating the rededication of the temple. <clears throat> It's not a God-implemented feast. When we look at all of the feasts in the Bible and when the Jews would go to Jerusalem and they would celebrate feasts, those were feasts that God says celebrate. This one was not. It, Judas Maccabeus, right? We've heard of the, the Maccabees, um, started it. So when you search it out, it's not in the Old Testament. You're not going to find it anywhere in the Bible. You're not going to find it anywhere because it's not there except here as a date stamp. So all that to say, <laughs> we have to get through some little history right now. Um, all that to say, it's a great date stamp. That's a great date stamp. It's Monica. It's winter. And Jesus was out of the weather, obviously, under the portico of Solomon or Solomon's colonnade, or Solomon's porch, however you want to um, talk about it. Um, it's the section that's on the east of the temple. So as you come into the temple, there's the main temple. This is the entire mount right there. The royal portico was over there from the king. But this section here on this eastern side 
was Solomon's portico. And you can see how the the columns, right? And this is just a rendering. Um, hundreds of columns just holding this thing up. So in comparison, this is the temple right there. That is a football field. So Port Solomon's portico was, it's, it's ginormous. It's huge. And that's where Jesus is teaching. And even after Jesus, even after Jesus, it was the gathering place for believers as the church got started. <laughs> they would gather in Solomon's portico, Solomon's porch right there. In Acts 3.11, it says Peter and John healed the lame guy right there. They preached to big crowds right there. In Acts 5, it says that the apostles did a bunch of miracles right there. Um, and that all the believers gathered right there, Solomon's portico, with one heart. And I love that. Even though this is not here today and this is just a rendering, we kind of get an idea that that's where the church started. Jesus was teaching there. The apostles continued teaching there. People would gather there. I mean, it's, it's close to the Jewish stuff, but it's not. It's just, it's just that it's right there, right near. I love that. So that's where we are. In verse 24, it says, that the Jews then gathered around him and were saying to him, how long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. And Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, these testify of me. But you do not believe because you are not of my sheep. Well, here... <laughs> Jesus, out of the weather, and the Jews surround him. They surround him. Now, they're starting to get physically aggressive, right? The, the, the word that's being used of surrounding him is the same word that we use when we besiege something. When we're going to take that hill, we're going to surround it, and we're pressing in. Right? So the Jews are starting to get physical. They encircle Jesus. And they ask him, are you the one? Are you the Christ? My question is, uh, apparent, or the statement is, apparently, they haven't been listening. They haven't been listening to everything Jesus has been saying. So my encouragement to you, based on that, right? Because we're going through... Um, the men's and the women's study, and we're looking at truths and we're looking at principles. I saw this and I'm like, hey, that's a principle. When God speaks, listen. <laughs> there you go. There's a principle. Apply that. We have no excuse. We can't blame God for our stupidity after he has explained himself to us. Jonathan made a point last week and when we were discussing everything that after God reveals himself to us, none of us have any excuse for not responding appropriately. Bottom line, God has revealed himself to us and we go, hmm, I can't blame God if I choose to go that direction. That's my own dumbness, right? So that's what the Jews are at, unbelieving. They don't want to believe, even though Jesus has said all of these, these things. Isaiah 53, one says, who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? The answer, apparently not these guys. <laughs> apparently not these guys. So Jesus, and I'm gonna paraphrase a little bit. Um, which you have to be careful when you paraphrase Jesus, but I'm going to paraphrase Jesus a little bit. Jesus says, dude, I've already told you. That's what he says. I've already told you. 
Jesus should have said, right? Right? Jesus should have said, just read the gospel of John up until this point. <laughs> just, just read the God. And I know it hadn't been written yet, but it would have been cool if it had, right? Because if you read the gospel of John up to this point, which the Jews were around, Jesus would have said, I've already told you. I am the word. I was with God. I am God. I created everything. I'm the light of the world. I came down from heaven. I'm the breath of life or the bread of life. I'm the one who gives eternal life. I told you that I'm the one God gave all authority to. I'm the one who gives living water. I'm the one who raises dead people and gives blind people sight. I'm the one who forgives sins. I'm the one who God loves. I'm his son. I'm the one you should be honoring just like you honor God. I'm the one you should give glory to just like God. I'm the one that the entire Old Testament was pointing towards. I'm the door to salvation. I am the shepherd, the good one. I am the lamb who takes away your sins. I told you before Abraham was, I am. And they say, tell us plainly? <laughs> tell us plainly? Serious? Isn't that plain enough? He basically says, you won't believe anything because you don't want to believe. You refuse to believe. Why are you refusing to believe? Because you are not my sheep. You are not my sheep. You know what? You guys are bad shepherds. Again, we're paraphrasing. You guys are bad shepherds and even worse sheep. They, they are not listening to anything jesus says <clears throat> in verse 27 he says my sheep hear my voice they hadn't heard his voice they refused to hear his voice my sheep hear my voice and i know them and they follow me and i give eternal life to them <clears throat> and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand my sheep, my sheep, my sheep heard me when I told them who I was. We just kind of went through that. My sheep heard me when I told them what I was doing, what my purpose was. My sheep understand that I am the good shepherd. My sheep know that they're forgiven. My sheep follow me. And here's something I'm giving to my sheep that you don't get, eternal life. That's a huge one, eternal life. And nothing can take that away from them. That's the awesome thing. I'm gonna give my sheep eternal life and nothing can take that away from them. No one can take even my sheep away from me. No one can take them out of my hand. I love that promise. I love that promise. That, that's the promise that, that the hand of Jesus is on my life. Figuratively, literally, however you want to put it, the promise is Jesus' hand is on his sheep. We are in his hand. We are safely held in our Savior's hand. God has perfect plans for us. And I love that. And for every one of his sheep that his hand are on, he knows them. He calls them by name. That's so awesome. Isaiah 43, 
1 to 3 says, Do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they will not overflow you. And when you walk through fire, you will not be scorched, nor will the flame burn you. For I am the Lord your God. Man, talk about a promise. When the hand of God is on you, you have nothing to fear. You have no worries. You have, I, because of the hand of God, I am invincible till the Lord takes me home, right? But until it's my time and God says it's your time, I'm invincible because the hand of God is on me. The funny thing is, and we'll, we won't get into it totally, but that is the P in tulip. <laughs> That's the P in tulip, right? The perseverance of the saints. And you all know that I believe, in my opinion, tulip is the most horrid explanation of those doctrines. I believe every one of those doctrines, but I think tulip is the, the most horrid explanation the perseverance of the saints makes it sound like we're doing something. We're doing, oh, oh, I'm going to persevere. And no, nope. <laughs> nope. You don't do anything. You can't do anything. It is all God and his hand upon you. His hand upon you, which I like using, right, to explain this. It's the persistence of his promises, that's what preserves us. That's what keeps us. That's what protects us in our salvation is the persistence of his promises. The persistence of Jesus' protection. Jesus promises his sheep will never perish. Jesus promises nothing can snatch them out of his hands those are his promises. They have nothing to do with what we can or cannot do. It is all Christ and Christ alone. The persistence of Christ's promises keep us. We are preserved by him. It's all Jesus. R.C. Sproul even says, I prefer the term the preservation of of the saints. Same idea. Because the process by which we are kept in a state of grace is something that is accomplished by God. My confidence in my preservation is not my ability to preserve. My confidence rests in the power of Christ to sustain me with his grace and by the power of his intercession. Thank God it's not by my strength because the enemy's powerful. The enemy will snatch Christ's hand out of the fold at every moment in time. But it's by the persistence of God's promises that he preserves us. And Jesus says, okay, that's me. That's my hand. That's my hand upon the sheep. If the hand of Christ keeping you, the promises of the Savior are not good enough for you, then Jesus adds to those promises. He says, look, if that's not good enough for you, that that's I am all powerful and my hand is on you, and I'm going to keep you. If that's not good enough for you, he adds to it. Verse 29. There's a gnat in here. Verse 29 says, My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand, and I and the Father are one. So so if, if my hand as the shepherd, the good shepherd, the good one, if that's not good enough for you, well, the heavenly father's hand is even more power is 
all powerful. You have got no argument with that. Jesus says, I got you. Dad's got you. You are fully got. That, that is a promise that we can rest assured on. That is so encouraging. And it this completely reinforces Jesus' promises to keep the sheep. Jesus' promises for security is completely supported by the Father. I, I love that. Jesus' promises to keep us are completely and utterly supported by the Father. Because Jesus says, the Father and I are one. Jesus said in, in John six thirty nine, this is the will of him who sent me that all that he has given me, I lose nothing but raise it up on the last day. Why? Why? Because me and the Father are one. I and the Father are one. And then everybody that was in the crowd went, uh-oh, as soon as he said that. Uh-oh, because that's the flashpoint, right? That's the combustible equation, or that's the ignition button, really. That's the ignition button. Me and God are one. Jesus is saying that God and I are one in essence, in nature, and in being. And we see their understanding of this statement by their response. <laughs> so we, we, we know that they understood exactly what he was stating because the Jews took this as major blasphemy. Blasphemy. Jesus saying he and God are one, this angers them more, more so than when he said, I came from heaven. Well, that angered him. That, that got them quite perturbed. But this, this elevates things to a whole nother level. This is right up there when Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am. I am. Claiming God. Claiming he is God. Both of those times, the Jews immediately picked up stones to murder him. Immediately picked up stones. And we see that in verse 31. The Jews picked up stones again to stone him. My question, they're in the temple. <laughs> Where do you find the stones? I I've asked this question before. They're in the temple. Where do you get the stones? This is the second time inside the Temple Mount boundaries that these guys find rocks to murder Jesus. Rocks. To, I'm, I'm convinced that Pharisees had to have a secret inner rock pocket. Okay. That's in their, in their tu tunic, right? They had to have a rock pocket in their tunic to be a Pharisee because you had to go around and, and be able to produce a rock to stone somebody at any time. It, it's either that or right next to the fire extinguishers, you had a little red box that was filled with stones that says in case of blasphemy, break glass. Yeah, seriously, where are they getting the stones? The in the pockets, the rock pockets. Got to be in the rock pockets. <laughs> but Jesus in his wisdom um, flips the tables on them once again. Not literally this time, but we'll get to see that later when he flips the tables again. But... Basically, he says, hey guys, hold on, context. Context is everything. Context is everything. Verse 32, he says, I showed you many works from the Father, for which of them are you stoning me? And the Jews answered him, for a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy, and because you... Being a man, make yourself out to be God. So they answer and they say, basically, oh, we're not stoning you for a good work. We like those. 
My mom is feeling much better now. Thank you. Right? They like the good works. You know, Aunt Betty, she sure likes being able to get up out of the wheelchair. That, that's pretty cool. You know, Cousin Joe, he sure likes to be able to see again. We're not stoning you for those things. We're stoning you because you make yourself out to be God. The Jews knew exactly what Jesus is claiming, and they're right. They are absolutely 100% right. He is claiming to be God. And it's funny, you, you have all these people that argue. I've had people argue with me. Well, Jesus never claimed to be God. I'm like, dude, you have not read your Bible. Well, he never says, I, I'm God. Well, let the Jewish leaders tell us what Jesus was claiming. Jesus claimed something. So if you don't want to if you don't want to look at Jesus' claim because he doesn't say, I am God, look at the Jewish leader's response. Look at what they say that Jesus is saying. They say, You make yourself out to be God. You claim to be God. So that defeats the argument immediately. There was absolutely no misunderstanding. They knew what he said. They knew what he claimed. And they wanted to murder him for it. So Jesus answers. Context. Remember, context is everything. Verse 34, he says, Has it not been written in your law? I said, you are gods. If he called them gods, lowercase, to whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken, do you say of him whom the Father sanctified and sent into the world, you are blaspheming because I said I am the Son of God? Context is everything. Jesus is quoting Psalm 82. And he starts to reason with their out of context stoning plan is basically what it is. In Psalm 82, God is scolding some judges who represented him. Judges who represented God, but were judging unjustly. Judges who were abusing their authority over people, over the people. Unjust judges that were speaking on behalf of God. There's the context. If, if you're speaking on behalf of God, or at least you're supposed to be speaking on behalf of God, it doesn't refer to a divine nature of these people, right? Lowercase God. It doesn't refer to a divine nature only that by proxy was this title given to them as they should have been judging like God. You represent me as the judge. I have put you in place. And if you represent me, you're speaking for me. Therefore, in Psalms, he says, well, you're God's because you're in that position. You're in that, I'm giving you that title, not the title of God. It's a lowercase, <laughs> lowercase title. And, but Jesus is really, he's saying, if God gave these unjust judges the title, lowercase gods, because of their office, because they were speaking on behalf of God, why do you consider it blasphemy when I call myself the son of God? Especially considering all the testimony of me and my works that you have seen with your own eyes. God calls them gods because they act in God's name. Pick a side. That's, that's what he's telling them. You pick a side. Which side are you going to fall on? Because scripture can't be broken. But context is everything. And they're twisting this out of context. See, 
Here's another principle. I love finding God. I love finding principles, right? Application, applied theology, practical righteousness, whatever we want to talk about. We cannot twist scripture to support our idea over here and then use it against somebody else when they're doing the same sin that we just did. It's okay if I, I can twist it over here, but then when you, I'm going to twist it a different way over there. Either God's word is one way or we're misapplying it. It can't be both and we can't twist it. But that, again, that's a whole nother study for men's, men's, men's study. Verse 37. If I do not do the works of my father, do not believe me. But if I do them, though you do not believe me, believe the works, so that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I in the Father. Again, Jesus is driving this home. He says, if I fail to walk the walk and talk the talk and work the works, then you have every right not to believe me. If I fail doing that, don't believe me. But, there's it, here we go. But, if I walk it, if I talk it, if I work it, the miracles, at least believe the perfect, mir miraculous works that you see. At least believe those because those are undeniable. The things that I'm saying, if you don't want to believe the things that I'm saying, all right. But the works, the miracles are undeniable. No one ever said, the blind guy, well, you really can't see after Jesus healed him. He says, you want to bet? Watch this. I can, right, poke you square in the eye because I, I can see now. Nobody ever argued about the miracles that Jesus did. But the dude that was laying on the mat for his entire life. Nobody ever argued that that guy was up and walking around again. So Jesus is saying, if you don't want to believe my words, look at the miracles and believe those. Those are undeniable. Believe the undeniable and you'll believe the truth that God is the one doing the undeniable. I'm just the one. I'm just doing what's undeniable because God the Father is in me and I'm in God the Father. We're one. And that's what he's saying. I am one with the Father. But that's not good enough. The miracles aren't good enough. They refuse to believe. Verse 39. Therefore, they were seeking again to seize him and he eluded their grasp like a ninja right jesus does a black uh, a backflip over one scribe slides through the grasp of two other pharisees right darts from one column to the next column runs down the wall sideways and dives through the window no, no, as cool as that would have been, right? Which that would have been pretty cool. That's not what the Bible says. But I do get a picture because you guys know me. I'm this, I'm, I'm, I picture everything. I'm, I do get a picture of all of these super tough, right? Super haughty Pharisees, super you know, elite gang-banging Pharisees just flying their, you know, their colors, their leather phylacteries, their little gang boxes, you know, all just standing there afraid to throw the first punch, afraid to throw the first rock. We've all seen, you know, crowds and crowds and crowds, and they're they're doing that little dance and doing that little dance, and nobody has 
the nerve to throw the first rock or throw the first punch. And Jesus kind of shaking his head. <laughs> you know, I just, I'm picturing things. Jesus shakes his head and he, he kind of walks through the crowd. Remember, they had surrounded him. They had besieged him all around. And Jesus just walks through. And, you know, maybe he makes eye contact with the guy that's got the biggest rock. Kind of shakes his head as he kind of walks on by. Maybe maybe he kind of like has to get really close and kind of twist right by the, the person that was shouting blasphemy the loudest. And he makes eye contact with that person. And that person still in fear, in fear of the power of Christ does not throw the stone. Jesus eludes their grasp. And as much as I would hope that there would have been ninja moves involved, there probably wasn't. Verse 40. After he eludes their grasp, it says, and he went away again beyond the Jordan to the place where John was first baptizing and he was staying there. Many came to him and were saying, while John performed no sign, yet everything John said about this man was true. And I love verse 42. We end the chapter. Many believed in him there. Many believed in him there. Jesus leaves Jerusalem and goes to Bethany beyond the Jordan. Back to where he got baptized. This is where John the Baptist baptized Jesus. So you got to go back to John chapter 1 to see where that was. But the point that we'll leave with this morning is many believed in him there. I love that. Jesus continues his ministry. Even though in this time frame, we're about maybe three and a half months before the crucifixion. That's all the time that we have left. Three months, three and a half months, three months and a week. But Jesus is not stopping. He's still gathering other sheep. He's calling others out of the grave into his marvelous light. He's continuing the purpose. Principle? That's what we should be doing. It's not over, it's not done. He hasn't come back to get us yet. We should be continuing. Over and over, Jesus told us his mission to do the Father's will, to seek the lost, to heal the lame, to save and keep his sheep. That's the gospel. That is the gospel. Christ redeeming us. Dead sinners, kind of in a dead sheepfold. That's where we were. Jesus, by his grace, by his sacrifice, made us alive, called us out of that dead sheepfold, and now we are in his fold. We are his sheep. We, we were his sheep the whole time. We just didn't know until he said, hey, come on, let's go. But now, according to his promises, we are forever his sheep. Nothing can snatch us out of his hand. Nothing. And I love getting the gospel into the mess into every message that we can because you never know when somebody on YouTube or Facebook or that's not here. I mean, I look around and you guys all know the gospel. You guys all have all received the gospel, but it's important for us to get the gospel out because we see the example of Jesus. He didn't stop. He's, he's, he's nearing, 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 nearing his death and his resurrection and he does not stop. Even on the cross, he's ministering to people. That's the example for us. So when the Lord's calling you, when the Lord's calling you, 
respond, say, yep, that's my shepherd. That's my shepherd. I'm going to follow him. I'm going to do what he says. I'm going to share how good my shepherd is with others so that others can know my shepherd and he can become their shepherd So I pray we would share that message to everyone who will listen (laughs) and even those that don't, even those that won't listen, share that message. That's, That's the commission that we have, that Jesus died to purchase us. Share that. Lord, we thank you for this morning, for your word, and we thank you for your promises. We trust We rest in those promises. We glorify you because of those promises. Lord, bless our conversations now. In Jesus' name, amen.